In Britain we have a weak government, um, but in Germany they don't have a government at all, uh, or at least they only have a caretaker one. Three months on from a federal election, and there's no sign yet of whether a majority government can be formed, <coughs> or if not, what will happen. The first attempt uh, at government making between the Christian Democrats, the Free Democrats and the Greens has failed. They've just started on a second attempt to put together another grand coalition. Not yet clear whether this is going to work. Uh, not yet also not clear what would happen if it doesn't. I mean, the choice would be either new elections, and the polls suggest that if they had new elections, the result would be much the same, or a minority government for which there's no precedent in Germany, and it's very hard to see how it would work. It's all very fluid, very uncertain, and very un-German. Um, nothing like this has ever happened before in modern German history. And many Germans feel pretty embarrassed by it. Um, a country famous for its stability seems to have lost its political way. So this may seem a rather odd moment to talk about Germany's domination of the European Union, but nonetheless, um, this is, I would maintain, the underlying reality of Europe today, and the current political impasse in Germany is not, I think, over the long term going to change this. So, um, Germany rules the EU. Uh, of course, Germany has always played a very influential role in Europe. The EU emerged from Franco-German reconciliation. It developed through Franco-German leadership. Some in Paris dream that the days of the Franco-German motor may return. President Macron certainly hopes so. But so far this century, it's Germany alone that has been at, in charge. And you can see this in all the big challenges that the EU has faced. The sovereign debt crisis, the banking crisis, Greece and the Euro, Ukraine, immigration across the Mediterranean, the, as it turned out, abortive negotiations with David Cameron over Britain's status in the EU. In all these cases, Germany provided the solutions, such as they were, and Germany took the lead in getting them implemented. Um, a nice quote from the Bulgarian foreign minister on the um, Eurozone negotiations. He said, Germany led all discussions on Eurozone issues, sometimes showing token respect for France's views. Germany's main allies, Finland and the Netherlands, played important but secondary roles. No one else mattered much, or at least mattered consistently. <laughs> Formally, of course, Germany is just one state among 28. In theory, the Commission proposes, the Council decides, and the European Parliament endorses or not. But in practice, the Commission doesn't make a proposal to which Germany is opposed. Council members tend to wait and see what Germany's position is before declaring their own. And the European Parliament, where German members have for decades occupied a very high number of the key positions, generally speaking, defers. Why so? Well, in the Clinton phrase, it's the economy, stupid. Not just the size of the German economy, it's between a third, uh, between a quarter and a half as large again as those of Britain or France, but it's character. Germany makes things that the rest of the world wants to buy. And it sells them on quality, on reliability, on innovation, and not just on price. Germany has healthy national finances. It has an excellent public administration and public services. And it has a much envied social model. People in Britain at one stage used to call it Rhineland capitalism. The Germans themselves prefer the phrase social market among 
academics now, ordo-liberalism seems to be the favoured term. It's a unique model. No other country in Europe or in the world has one exactly like it. But it works, and Germany's partners are therefore <coughs> willing to take lessons from the country that has developed it. There are other factors too. The high quality of German political leadership over the years, <coughs> the prominent role of um, Germany's political parties in the two main political families of Europe, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, and of course the absence of any competing model. So are the Germans proud of their power? Absolutely not. They are, to use a phrase coined by a British academic, a reluctant hegemon. No German politician would dream of using the sort of phrases that trip off American tongues when <coughs> describing their country's role in the world. Born to lead, the indispensable nation, the city on the hill, manifest destiny. Germans would squirm if anybody tried to talk in those terms about um, their own country. They haven't set out to lead. They don't want to lead, but others have chosen <coughs> to follow. Germany has acquired <coughs> leadership, in effect, by default. But they are proud of the EU. For the German political class, Europe is not discussed in the kind of transactional terms used here in Britain. Think of it this way. Europe is Germany's state religion. People may not believe passionately in it, but they are expected to show it respect. Criticism is tolerated up to a point. Germany is a lively democracy, but it's not really encouraged in the mainstream media or in mainstream political debate. Plenty of discussion about particular EU policies, but virtually no critical examination about the nature of the EU itself. Even Alternative für Deutschland, the, the right-wing party that obtained nearly 13% of the votes in the last election, has stopped, it started as a, an anti-Euro movement. It stopped now banging on so much about Europe. It focuses on immigration and Islam. And the reasons for this lie, to a great measure, in Germany's own history. Germany is a land without a past. Um, Germany has dealt with the terrible events of 1933 to 1945 by facing up to them and ensuring that the younger generation knows about them. The wonderful word Vergangenheitsbewältigung has entered the language. No other country in the world has done anything like this, faced up to its past in the same way. But in rejecting the National Socialist period, Germany has in effect rejected the rest of its past as well. The EU, by contrast, is the future. Germany was present as a founder member at the creation, uh, unlike the United Nations or NATO, which it joined only after they had been in existence for some time. And the EU offers Germans a vehicle to exercise power and enthusiasm without guilt, something which otherwise they only do in the context of football. <laughs> but in rejecting their own nationalism and their own history, many Germans, particularly the political class, have become, I think, insensitive to the national allegiances of others. In German public discourse, the expression of loyalty to a nation state and not to Europe as a whole is portrayed as, at best, a foible. Um, disapproval of nationalism in Germany translates into a belief that the EU represents some superior moral entity by comparison to which the nation state is old fashioned and time expired. So, what is it that Germany wants the EU to become? What's the German vision of Europe? Well, there isn't one, or at least not one that can easily be identified. Officially, German governments believe in something they call a political union. But nowhere is there any authoritative text, no speech, no white paper, no government statement or whatever, which sets out what Germany actually means by this phrase. In a speech to the European Parliament in, 20, in 2012, Angela Merkel 
said that the Commission should become the government of Europe, the European Parliament should be its source of democratic accountability, and the Council of Ministers its upper chamber. Exactly how Germany is governed, Bundesregierung, Bundestag, Bundesrat. But what she didn't do was to spell out at all what should be the powers of these bodies and what powers should be left to the member states. So is it hypocrisy for Germans to preach a political union when they can't um, explain exactly what it would look, at, look like? No, I don't think so, not necessarily. There's nothing wrong in advocating a direction of travel without <coughs> specifying the exact destination. It's how the EU has traditionally proceeded. Changes were made when there was a perceived need for them rather than according to some um, preconceived blueprint. Public opinion, it could be argued, can accept a kind of step-by-step -step approach without necessarily having to face up to a full long-term prospectus. It, it's a perfectly reputable argument. But it, the show was kept on the road until 2016 when the British voted to leave. And I think one reason why we voted to leave was a concern about what you might call destinationless travel. A worry that the concept of ever closer union meant a permanent escalator of integration, the cession of ever more power to the EU, without any indication of where this would actually lead. But even if the Germans themselves don't want or aren't able to talk about the end destination of the EU, it is possible to interpret their intentions as material to go on. And the material consists not of what German politicians say about Europe, but how they behave within it. And the German behaviour within the EU over the decades has consistently reflected Germany's own national interests. In the economic field, these are the single market in goods, ensuring that the EU doesn't become a transfer union and that its budget remains small, a liberal external trade policy, a euro based on sound money and low inflation, the enforcement of fiscal discipline among the EU's members, certainly among the Eurozone members, no mutualization of Eurozone countries' debts or borrowing abilities, measures of tax harmonization to limit the ability of other Eurozone states to attract business away from Germany, some opening of the market in services designed to allow big German companies to exploit opportunities in other member states, but to protect small German companies from competition in Germany itself, social and environmental legislation which, in effect, imposes German standards on others. This has been the basis of German economic policy in the EU for decades. I don't see any reason why it should change in future. Now, of course, there are other areas of EU activity where the track record isn't so long that you can um, derive clear conclusions. Internal security, for instance. Um, Immigration is now a big, big issue in Germany. Uh, it's an area where Mrs Merkel rather uncharacteristically misjudged the public mood when she announced that all refugees from Syria would be welcome. Uh, she and her government have been backtracking ever since. What German wants from the EU is better control of the, export, the external borders and some mechanism for sharing out the burden of accommodating those who legally or illegally have got in. Uh, Germany has been willing to suspend the operation of the Schengen Agreement um, in order to achieve this. And it has been very tough in imposing its policy. In 2015, the Commission proposed at German behest a system of compulsory quotas for refugees. It was bitterly opposed by the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. The Hungarian Prime Minister accused Germany of moral imperialism. His Slovak counterpart used the phrase Berlin-Brussels diktat. In the past, 
um, remarks like this would have left the German political class feeling a bit uncomfortable. Not, it seems, anymore. Immigration will remain a big issue for Germany. It's perhaps the one area where German governments may be prepared for the EU to spend serious amounts of money. And finally, foreign policy, defence policy. This is an area where the contrast between what Germans say about Europe and how they behave is particularly stark. Germany's declared aim is to abandon a national foreign policy. Germany wants, so its politicians say, um, an exclusive common European foreign policy with a single EU seat on the United Nations Security Council. And when some other spokesman says um, that a common European army would be a good idea, the German defence minister can be relied upon to say, yes, indeed it would. And taken at face value, these would be momentous changes. The EU's member states would effectively disappear as international actors in their own right. Uh, the implications for <coughs> Britain would be enormous. Um, it's one thing for us to be living next door to an economic superpower with very little ability to influence its decisions. I mean, this is the fate that already awaits us. But living next door to a political and military superpower in the way that, say, Canada lives next to the United States um, would be an enormous change. So is this what Germany really wants? If so, it's striking that over the years they have done so little to bring it about. Um, there have been two appointments to the position of High Representative for Foreign Policy in the EU, uh, Catherine Ashton, Frederica Mogherini. Neither of them, it's fair to say, are political heavyweights. On neither occasion when they were appointed did the German government propose a German politician to do the job. And there would have been plenty of well-qualified German candidates who would have performed it well. And when it came to the biggest challenge in the security field that uh, Europe has faced in recent times, the Russian invasion of Crimea and the war in the Donbass, Germany <coughs> preferred bilateral diplomacy. When Mrs. Merkel went to Minsk to broker an agreement between Presidents Putin and Poroshenko, she took President Hollande with her, but poor Madame Mogherini, the EU foreign minister, was left at home. Now, not having a German government has um, meant a pause in the conduct of EU business, and the person who has found this no doubt most frustrating is President Macron, the new or newish kid on the European bloc. He has talked a good talk about reforming the EU, and one of the first priorities for the German government will be to decide how to respond to his ideas. And it will not be easy. Um, there'll be lots of symbolic hugs and handshakes. There'll be lots of protestations about the renewal of the Franco-German relationship. But so far, it's difficult to see what the common ground is going to be. President Macron wants a Eurozone finance minister and a big Eurozone budget to finance infrastructure projects. He also wants common insurance arrangements for depositors, he wants a substantial Eurozone stability fund, and though he hasn't said so specifically, he probably hankers after some shared EU responsibility for member states' debts and for the provision of common credit. All these ideas have so far been anathema in Germany. For the Germans, the future lies, quite simply, in better fiscal discipline on the part of the member states, and for the European Commission to exercise some right of control over their national budgets. There'll be differences too when it comes to foreign and defence policy. President Macron wants more cooperation in these areas, but he has shown no disposition so far to give up France's seat on the UN Security Council, nor any enthusiasm for allowing the European Commission or the European Parliament to play a role in military matters. Yet these are precisely what the German government says it wants. In any case, defence costs money, and Germany is at the moment well below the NATO target of 2% of GDP on defence. 
I find it hard to see any German government, certainly not a grand coalition, agreeing to spend significant amounts of new money on um, an EU um, defence fund. My conclusion is that, in reality, though no German politician would admit this, Germany is now more of a status quo adherent than a reformer when it comes to the future direction of the EU. The present arrangements suit Germany well. Germany is the principal beneficiary of both the single market and the euro, and although it's also the biggest net contributor to the EU budget, overall the EU is not an intolerable financial drain on Germany's public finances. The Germans' main priority in the future will be to ensure that this remains the case. And so inevitably to Brexit. It may dominate the political agenda here in Britain, but it doesn't in Germany. Germany's current EU priorities are sustaining the euro and dealing with immigration. Brexit is a second order issue. Germany's priorities, and they will be decisive, um, are to maintain the unity of the 27, to protect the integrity of the single market, including all four freedoms, and to avoid, as far as possible, having to pick up the bill. Some British commentators seem surprised that on the issue of immigration, um, Angela Merkel wasn't willing to cut David Cameron a bit more slack in what turned out to be those abortive um, uh, renegotiations. I think the reason she didn't was not to do with immigration itself. It was because of the fear that if you allow one member state to have special rules on the free movement of people, that might open the door for other member states to demand special rules like import surcharges on the free movement of goods. And that, for Germany, would be a nightmare. It would be the thin end of a potentially very, very uncomfortable wedge. Uh, retaining access to the British market is also a priority for German firms, but it's not a decisive one. They sell on reliability and quality, not on price. They can absorb a WTO tariff if they have to. BMW doesn't have to build its minis down there in Cowley. It's got lots of other factories in the EU as well. I mean, overall, Germany would certainly prefer Britain to leave the EU on the basis of an agreement. Order is a much prized quality um, in Germany, and a disorderly British exit would be damaging to the EU's reputation. But as always, the Germans will be guided by their own national interests. They will interpret them in a rational, predictable, but unsentimental way. As we now realize, Brexit is going to be an adversarial ne negotiation. The Germans have been the toughest so far on the terms of our divorce, particularly over the financial settlement, and they will continue to be so in future. Once we have left the EU, we can hope to establish a new cordial relationship with Germany. It won't be as close as before because we will have less to talk about together and from a German perspective we will be less important. But when it comes to the negotiations themselves, we need to recognise that the Germans have their own interests. They are not there to be our friends. One final observation, and I make it because I think it illustrates the gulf between British and German approaches to the way the EU is governed. In 2013, Jean-Claude Juncker, as we know, was appointed President of the European Commission, the body which, according to German doctrine, equates to the government of Europe. Bild Zeitung, the biggest selling newspaper in Europe, published an editorial hailing this as, for the first time, a real triumph of democracy in the EU. It's an editorial that was written, and usually by, not by the paper's editor, but by the chief executive of the Axel Springer Group, who um, built. In Britain, not one person voted for Mr Juncker. Not one single person. As far as we know, not one single British member of the European Parliament voted for Juncker. 
The British Prime Minister was opposed to his appointment, as were the leaders of all the other political parties in Britain. So how, from a British perspective, was this an example of democracy? It's not a question which any German politician or commentator has thought it worth commenting on. Thank you.